This is one of the oldest, most revered churches in the world, and yet they tried to bomb it. I'm standing in what for centuries has been the prime church in Rome, for that matter in all of Western Christendom, St. John Lateran. This church was founded by Constantine the Great in the year 314. It had been standing open for more than 16 centuries. Then in 1993, a bomb went off, heavily damaging this ancient church, a bomb planted by terrorists. I'm Edmund Prodom, and for the next hour, we will be exploring the connection between world events and the seven signs of Christ's return as found in the Old and New Testaments of the Bible. Many people bound to the Gregorian calendar see a relationship between the horrendous events of the 90s and the new millennium. Millions of churchgoers see the terrorism, the moral decay and the natural disasters that so characterize this decade as conditions pointing to the second coming of Jesus Christ. They're asking, is ours the generation that the prophets were pointing their fingers at? Are the end times at hand? Millions believe that there are several events that must take place before Christ returns to this world. The Bible foretells of seven momentous events that will herald the second coming of Christ. I'm not a theologian, of course, but I can recognize that one of these events is contemporary history. And another event is history in the making. The first event, or sign, is the greatest homecoming in human history, and the bloodiest, the return to the Holy Land of the Jewish people, a biblical promise fulfilled in our century. The second is the welding of Western Europe into an unprecedented superpower, a union being forged in this very hour. The third, the rise of a dictator whose monstrosities could dwarf even those of Adolf Hitler. The fourth, the worldwide dominance of a new religion whose godhead will be Satan, the Antichrist, and the false prophet, the unholy trinity. The fifth is the building of the third temple of Jerusalem on a site where one of the holiest shrines of Islam now stands, a site that many Muslims have promised to shed their blood to defend. The sixth, an invasion of Israel by ruthless armies from the north who will not be defeated by military force, but by the catastrophic forces of nature of a magnitude never before known. And finally, the bloodiest, most destructive battle ever to be fought by human beings, Armageddon. These are the seven signs of Christ's return. A thousand years before they planted their bomb, St. John Lateran's was the Pope's church. On New Year's Eve of the year 999, Pope Sylvester II said mass here for a congregation clad in sackcloth and ashes, the trappings of penance for one's sins. Many of the rich in the congregation had given away their lands. Others had freed their bondsmen. Now, in fear and dread, they waited for the church bells to usher in a new millennium and the second coming of Jesus Christ. The bells rang out. It was now the year 1000, but Christ did not appear. Without event, the sun rose on that first day of a new millennium. Today, people are searching for signs, for explanations for the mounting tragedies of the 90s. Sudden earthquakes, volcanoes exploding in cyclonic winds of ash and pitch, 
darkness at noon. Hurricanes, fierce and frequent. Assassinations. Terrorism, before which the world's most powerful governments seem helpless. The carnage of war and the specter of AIDS. Is our Earth like a toy top in its final spin? People want answers. Some seek them in a haze of auras, in the properties of crystals, in tarot cards, in astrological chartings of the heavens. Many Christians argue that there's no need for stargazing. They claim to see clear-cut signs of Christ's imminent return, though they admit that they don't know exactly when this will take place. They don't claim to be God's mind readers. This book, which occupies a drawer in most hotel rooms, has been translated into just about every language on earth. About 25% of all that's written in the Bible is prophecy. There are dozens of prophecies dealing with Christ's coming into this world, but there are hundreds of promises related to Christ's second coming. Some prophecies describe the times we live in. Nation shall rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be great earthquakes, famine and pestilence, and fearful events and great signs from heaven. Many of the Bible's prophecies were fulfilled centuries ago. Some are being fulfilled now, in our lifetime. And there are others, like God's wrath pouring down over the earth, that we hope will be in the far distant future. Many Christians are asking, can it be that these prophecies will converge in our lifetime? Let us delve deeply into these prophecies. We will learn that like the seven candles of a menorah, they light the seven signs, signaling the return of Jesus Christ. We discover the first sign, Israel restored. The prophecies are crystal clear. Christ will not return to this world until after the restoration of the Jewish people to nationhood. On that New Year's Day of the year 1000, there was no need for Christians to panic at the time the Jewish people were scattered over the globe. Today, the Jews can celebrate their return to the land that their God had promised them. And what a land they've made of it. The dry, dead bones of the past sprang to life. Thousands upon thousands of trees were planted. Desert was turned into orchards. The modern Israelis have made themselves worthy of an ancient promise, but not without bloodshed. The Jewish people as a nation began when the patriarch Abraham obeyed his God's command. Leave your country and go to the land I will show you. This is the land his God promised him, a crossroads between Asia and Europe at the heart of where civilization began, a land of wild hills and salt-encrusted shores. Geographically, the ancient Jews were wedged in between the superpowers of Egypt and Assyria, and surrounded by peoples determined to drive them out of the land they believed God had assigned to them. Then, as now, the Promised Land was plagued by constant warfare. In time, Assyria conquered the northern kingdom of Israel. Its ten tribes are lost to history. Later, the southern kingdom of Judah was overwhelmed by the forces of Nebuchadnezzar and its people carried off to Babylon in chains. When the Persians crushed Babylon, Abraham's descendants were free to go back to the Promised Land. Then, the Promised Land was occupied by Rome. Rome built cities, Rome built baths, Rome built amphitheaters, and Rome brought in her gods. The Roman yoke had become more than Jews could bear. They revolted, and it was a rebellion that took mighty Rome almost four years to crush. 
Now the wrath of Rome came down upon Israel in full fury. There was an explosion of fleeing Jews that reached to every known part of the globe. In their exile, they were sustained by the promise as set down by their prophets. This is what the Lord Almighty says. I will save my people from the countries of the East and the West. I will bring them back to live in Jerusalem. They will be my people. But Jerusalem fell into the hands of Muslim powers that Islamized it. For centuries, the land called Palestine was a part of the Ottoman Turkish Empire until the Turks were defeated in World War I. This permitted a trickle of Jews to return to the homeland. Then in the 1930s, from Nazi Germany, came shock waves of Jew hating that paled the persecutions of the past. Jews were marked with yellow stars. Jewish storefronts were smashed. Synagogues were burnt down, sometimes with their congregations inside. By the millions, Jews were shipped to concentration camps in a program designed to annihilate the Jewish people once and for all. World War II erupted. After Germany's defeat, Jewish survivors of the Holocaust sailed to the shores of their ancient homeland, only to be turned back. Then, after nine months of debate, the United Nations voted to partition Palestine into an Arab and a Jewish state. On the 14th of May of 1948, the new state of Israel was born, and with it, the first sign pointing to Christ's return. People danced in the streets. They came singing. Jews as different from each other as Morocco is from Manhattan. Jews from the Kasbahs and the Sukhs, from New York's garment district. From hiding places in Amsterdam, from England and Switzerland. From refuge in Sweden from India and Ethiopia, from Yemen and Detroit. Theirs was a biblical bonding to a land that most of them had never seen. I will plant Israel in their own land, never again to be uprooted from the land I have given them. These words of the prophet Amos were spoken some 2,700 years ago. Israel restored. To the world, it seemed like the impossible dream, yet one by one, the barriers that made it so were removed. Many believe by the hand of God. This sign has come in our lifetime. How many more will follow? The second sign, Europe united. Then said the king, Surely your God is the God of gods and the Lord of kings and a revealer of mysteries. Once this city of Rome was the greatest capital in the Western world. Today, Rome is still a capital the capital of one of several Western European nations that have formed a confederation known as the European Union, or more commonly, the EU. The EU is dynamic. It upholds the ideal of a united Europe by integrating its member nations economically and politically. It adheres to common policies in trade, in agriculture. It fosters a single European monetary system for all of the member nations. It supports a multinational parliament. Should the EU decide to build a united Europe army, it will emerge as the Roman Empire of the 21st century. Remarkably, the whole EU operation was foreseen some 2,600 years ago. It happened in Babylon, the fabled Babylon of the Hanging Gardens. King Nebuchadnezzar was tortured by a dream he'd had, and he sent for a Jewish visionary named Daniel to put him at peace. Daniel told him, O oh, King, your mind turned to things to come. 
He went on to describe an enormous statue of four metals of varying degrees of hardness, depicting great empires of the ancient world. The golden head, Babylon. The silver chest and arms, the Persian Empire. And the bronze midsection, the conquering Greeks. The triumph of Rome over the others is represented by the statue's iron legs. Of particular interest are the feet of iron and clay. The ten toes, symbolizing ten nations that will yield their sovereignty to Rome. Daniel had his own vision of the future. It was nightmarish. He saw four terrible beasts rising up out of the sea. The first, the winged lion of Babylon. The second, a bear, symbolizing the Persian Empire. The third, a leopard, symbolizing Alexander the Great and his empire. The fourth beast, most terrifying of all, Rome, which devoured the other three. It had large iron teeth. It crushed and devoured its victims. It had ten horns. The prophet goes on to say that only after this Roman superpower is destroyed will Christ return to earth and establish a kingdom that will not pass away. But the idea of imperial Rome never really died. The ghosts of the Caesars have always loomed behind European leadership. In the 8th century, Charlemagne was crowned Holy Roman Emperor. The Holy Roman Empire reached its zenith during the Renaissance under Charles V. Napoleon so craved Roman imperial power that he crowned himself emperor. Rome reached well into the 20th century with a Tsar Nicholas and a Kaiser Wilhelm. The titles Tsar and Kaiser mean Caesar. Benito Mussolini strutted through his 21-year dictatorship of Italy as a Caesar. With wild enthusiasm, the people hailed him, il duce, duce, meaning our leader, our leader. He restored the old Roman name for the Mediterranean, Mare Nostrum, our sea. The emblem of his iron-fisted rule was the fasces, a bound bundle of rods displayed in ancient Rome as a symbol of authority. While he ruled, he was pompous proof that even in the 20th century, the notion of imperial Rome is far from dead. Today, the flags of the European Union are flying over many of the ancient empire's territories. The United States of Europe. This was a post-war dream of Winston Churchill and of Konrad Adenauer, the first German chancellor after the Nazi surrender. To this end, in 1958, Europe's leaders met on Rome's Capitoline Hill and established the European Common Market, which grew to become the European Union we know today. If the EU is indeed the coalition of ten nations foreseen by the prophet Daniel, it will become a political superpower. Industrially, it will be one of the most productive powers on earth. It will support a huge multinational army with the most sophisticated weapons. And, says the prophet, it will enforce one credo, one religious yoke, on all within its sphere. Who will be the master of this political powerhouse, this economic giant, this military colossus? The third sign is the coming of the Antichrist. There before me was another horn, a little one, which came up among them, and three of the first horns were uprooted before it. This horn had eyes like the eyes of a man, and a mouth that spoke boastfully.
The prophet Daniel foresaw the rise of a dictator of a ten-nation confederation headquartered in Rome. He will set himself up against Christ in the last days before the second coming. He foresaw a man who uproots all who oppose him in his rise to absolute power. His eyes, the eyes of a man, show a keen intelligence. And his mouth that spoke boastfully foretells of a speaker of great authority, a charismatic orator who mesmerizes masses of followers. To him, the people surrender all, their will, their loyalty, their love, their freedom, their very souls. They are convinced he is a savior. In a world bleeding from wars, he promises peace. In a world reeling from terrorism, he establishes order. He stabilizes shaky economies. He unites his followers in a new world order. To this suffering world, our world, he will appear heaven-sent. Nothing could be further from the truth. He is the Antichrist sent by Satan. A stern-faced king. A master of intrigue. Who will succeed in whatever he does. If prophecy rings true, it is possible that the Antichrist is already among us. And there is every reason to believe that he will be a European. You or I may have brushed past him on a city street. Or sat next to him on an airliner. Or shared a bench with him in a Paris park. To millions of Christians, he is the enemy. In his scrabble to power, he will stack up more and more popular support. And why not? To the secularized multitudes of the West who are weary of endless overlapping wars, of tribal rivalries and slaughter, weary of ethnic cleansings, of the plague of narcotics, of rampant terrorism, weary of the seeming purposelessness of life. A latchkey generation of youth will fix on him for an ideal, for discipline, longing to be told what to live for and what to die for. Believers are certain that he will achieve absolute power over every man, woman and child within the Ten Nation Confederation from cradle to grave. He will determine who shall be born and who shall be aborted. Who shall be educated and who simply shall be cannon fodder. For his Ballyhooed peace platform will one day become a springboard into war. He will determine who among the aged should be done away with after outliving their usefulness. And he will tolerate no dissension, no debate. To grasp the appeal and the awesome power of the Antichrist, we can reach back into the past, to the blighted first half of the 20th century. Adolf Hitler offers a realistic insight into what we can expect from the Antichrist. Indeed, when Hitler was in power, there were those who believed that he truly was the Antichrist. This is understandable from a study of Hitler's face. It is obviously that of the stern-faced king foreseen by the prophet Daniel. Hitler was certainly a master of intrigue. And the eyes, cunning, keenly intelligent. As for Daniel's foreseeing a dictator with a mouth that spoke boastfully, Hitler was a spellbinder. Through a series of calculated street brawls and his own hypnotic oratory, Hitler became Germany's supreme leader. He claimed he wanted only to restore Germany's rightful place among the nations of the world, peacefully. A peace candidate. Christians believe this is how the Antichrist will present himself in his rise to power. 
By incorporating Europe into his Third Reich, Hitler was master of nearly all of the Roman Empire's most important European colonies. It seemed only a matter of moving his capital from Berlin to Rome itself. But Britannia, Britain, held out and fought him off. As World War II turned against him, it seemed less likely that Hitler was the Antichrist of prophecy. Yet Adolf Hitler is the closest we can come to understanding the Christian vision of the Antichrist. Like Hitler, he will mesmerize the masses so that he can enslave them. Hitler's thousand-year Reich lasted less than 12 years. During those years, however, the control that Hitler exercised over peoples and nations was awesome. Yet by today's standards, the tools that he had with which to control them were primitive. There were no electronics as we know them. The prophesied dictator, the Antichrist, will be an updated Hitler. But unlike Hitler, all of the astounding advances in electronic technology will be at his disposal. Vast media networks and mind control electronics will serve his ends. The most destructive weaponry will be his to command. And he will program humankind to do his bidding. The fourth sign, a new worldwide religion. One of the heads of the beast seemed to have a fatal wound, but the fatal wound had been healed. The final decades of this millennium have seen more than their share of assassins and would-be assassins of heads of state. There was the attempt on the life of President Ronald Reagan the wounded president survived, but attempts on other leaders were more successful. Egyptian Premier Anwar Sadat, Indira Gandhi, Prime Minister of the Republic of India, Israel Yitzhak Rabin. Christians are confounded by the assassination of the Antichrist, alluded to in the final book of the Bible, Revelations or the Apocalypse. He will be wounded. This is what prophecy tells us, fatally wounded. Then, as if by a miracle, he is healed. In a sense, he overcomes death, perhaps in blatant mockery of the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. The scriptures tell us the whole world was astounded and followed the beast. Then this dictator, the Antichrist, will enthrone himself as a living God. The world has seen this before. We recall that in July of 1944, several high-ranking officers of the German army conspired to kill Hitler with a concealed bomb, a deadly bomb. Miraculously, Hitler suffered only minor injuries. To his loyal followers, Hitler had not only thwarted treason, he had supernaturally triumphed over death. Again, we turn to this demonic dictator to better understand the Antichrist to come. While he held the world in his iron grip, Hitler tried to edge God off his throne. Heil Hitler replaced God be with you as a greeting. Christian rituals were overwhelmed, if not replaced, by pagan pageantry. The honored place of the Holy Scriptures was taken over by Hitler's autobiographical Mein Kampf. Hitler worship reached its depths in the fervor of the SS, the Führer's military elite. SS units carried out their inhuman orders under the sign of the Death Head. The infant child of an SS member was given its name in a ceremony that blatantly mocked the Christian rite of baptism. 
swaddled in a shawl of swastikas. The infant was given its name at an altar, which held a portrait of Hitler in place of a cross. As British writer Clive James observes, not many of us in a secular age are willing to conceive that in the form of Hitler, Satan visited the earth and recruited an army of sinners. Then I saw another beast coming out of the earth. He had two horns like a lamb, but he spoke like a dragon. He exercised all the authority of the first beast on his behalf and made the earth and its inhabitants worship the first beast, whose fatal wound had been healed. The coming of another is prophesied, a false prophet who will rally all peoples to the worship of the world dictator. The Bible tells us that he will cause fire to come down from heaven, yet he will not make himself an object of worship. Rather, he will direct the people's adoration to the dictator, the Antichrist. He will make the Antichrist's lies sound like truth. And so this dictator economically and militarily, the most powerful the world will ever know, will deem himself divine. He will strive to duplicate Christ's earthly miracles. Where Jesus gave sight to the blind, he will employ perhaps as yet undiscovered medical treatments for blindness. Where Jesus made the lame to walk, he might restore deadened nerves and atrophied muscle electronically and chemically where Jesus raised Jairus' daughter from the dead. He may, Frankenstein-like, use astounding new technologies to try and match the miracle. Or with satanic powers, he may harness the genuinely supernatural in his miracle workings. Because the Bible says it is Satan who is fueling this duo of antichrist and false prophet. As from the beginning, Satan, the adversary, the deceiver, is determined to seduce mankind away from God. The end times will see the greatest deception of all. Satan as the father, Antichrist as the son, and the false prophet as the Holy Spirit. Man worshipping an unholy trinity. Our times might welcome such a takeover. Our Western world is gripped by spiritual confusion. Petty prophets spring up everywhere. Many truth seekers are seduced into the ranks of bizarre cults. In Jonestown in Guyana, a false prophet commands his followers to commit mass suicide by swallowing Kool-Aid laced with cyanide. 800 men, women and children go to their deaths. In following a false messiah, whole families perish in a Waco, Texas shootout. In Switzerland and in Canada, more than half a hundred members of the Order of the Solar Temple, vested in ceremonial robes, either take their own lives or are shot to death by fellow cultists. The followers of another false prophet, a self-proclaimed reincarnation of Christ and Buddha, release a lethal gas in a Tokyo subway at rush hour. Thousands of commuters are hospitalized, some die. Violence fueled by religious fervor. Indeed, the worship of an unholy trinity may not be far off. The fifth sign, the rebuilding of the temple. I was given a reed like a measuring rod and was told, Go and measure the temple of God and the altar, and count the worshippers there. Jerusalem, the golden, the city of God. Its pavements worn smooth by the boots of conquerors, Assyrians and Babylonians, Greeks and Romans, Saracens and Ottomans. Its gates the holy portals of pilgrims, Jewish, Christian, Muslim. 
Its name means peace. Its history spells conflict. Yet it is the city for which almost every human soul feels a homesickness. This is Jerusalem's golden gate, silent amid thundering prophecy. Both Jews and Christians keep an eye on this gate. To Jews, it is the gate through which the Messiah will enter Jerusalem and restore Israel to its former glory. To Christians, it is the gate through which Jesus Christ will re-enter his city. Well schooled in these prophecies, the Muslim Ottomans sealed the gate in 1530. And knowing that the Messiah, as a Jewish high priest, is forbidden to cross a cemetery, they fronted the gate with a broad graveyard. This is Jerusalem's crown, the Temple Mount, the biblical Mount Moriah, and the heart of the Jewish faith. Though it covers only 35 acres, it is the most fought over piece of land on earth. It was here, as seen in this model, that King Solomon built the first temple of Jerusalem with the cedars of Lebanon but it was destroyed in 586 BC by Babylonian invaders. By 26 BC, King Herod the Great completed the building of the second temple. It was his greatest achievement. To this temple, its white marble facade shimmering with golden ornament, Jews from every province of the Roman Empire made Passover pilgrimages. It was here in the court of Gentiles that Jesus, in his fury, cleansed the temple of money changers and hawkers. The Emperor Caligula's attempt to install his graven image in the temple so riled the Jews that they revolted against Rome. At first, they were successful. But in 70 AD, Roman forces captured the city, burnt down the temple, and carried the sacred temple vessels back to Rome as booty. All that remains today of Jerusalem's temples is a retaining wall of massive stone blocks rising to a height of 50 feet, called Ha Kotel, or the Western Wall. In all of Jewish civilization, this is the holiest place. What crowns the Temple Mount today is a marvel of Muslim architecture the Kubet es Sakra, or Dome of the Rock. It is as sacred to the followers of Mohammed as the temple was to the children of Israel. It shelters a rock upon which it is said the patriarch Abraham prepared to sacrifice his son Isaac. It is also the rock from which Muslims believe the prophet Mohammed ascended into heaven. Christians and Jews are forbidden from praying of the dome or at the lovely Al-Aqsa Mosque, which stands nearby. Yet the mount is the only site upon which the Jews may build a new, a third temple of Jerusalem. And rebuilding the temple is foremost in the minds of most religious Jews. The Temple Mount. Both Jews and Muslims claim it as their own. A former deputy mayor of Jerusalem called these conflicting claims a time bomb of apocalyptic dimensions. By 691 AD, the Muslims had completed building the Dome of the Rock. It has dominated the Temple Mount for 13 centuries. They're not about to see it raised to make way for a third and final Jewish temple. Many Jews pray for a miracle. The temple will come from heaven, they say. But there are zealots plotting to take the Temple Mount by force. One temple activist, a former soldier in the Israeli army, has attracted thousands of followers. Our vision, he explains, is to move the mosque, to move the dome of the rock, and to have them rebuilt in Mecca. A group known as the Temple Institute is already preparing for a revived Jewish priesthood Ritual instruments of sacrifice are being made. Ritual vestments are being sewn. 
In the shadow of the Western Wall, there are Talmudic schools where eager students are trained to perform the ancient rituals of the Jewish priests. A scale model of the Third Temple has already been constructed. Yet the Muslims hold fast to the Temple Mount. In 1990, a riot erupted when a group of Jews tried to lay a cornerstone for the new temple. Many Christians believe that Jesus Christ will not return to this world until the third temple of Jerusalem is built. How is it possible with this tinderbox situation between Muslim and Jew? He was given authority over every tribe people, language, and nation. The ten-nation dictator will intervene. He will come as a peacemaker. If possible, he will deceive even the elect. Once and for all, he will settle the conflict over the Temple Mount. There will be no further dispute. The Temple will be rebuilt. And the children of Israel will rejoice. He has done more than settle a dispute, they'll say. He has fulfilled the covenant that the Lord God made with Abraham. But the celebrated dictator has other covenants to establish. He enters into an agreement in which he restores Palestine to the Israelites. This covenant marks the beginning of a seven-year period of tribulation, which will end only with the second coming of Christ. He ordered them to set up an image in honor of the beast who was wounded by the sword and yet lived. Now the false prophet, that hidden spine of power, enthrones the dictator Antichrist in the new temple of Jerusalem. All the inhabitants of the earth will worship the beast, all whose names have not been written in the book of life. His image is to be worshipped, adored, prayed to. All who refuse will be killed. The betrayed Israelites respond as their ancestors had when the Emperor Caligula tried to install his image in their temple. They revolt. They fight. And the dictator retaliates with such bloodletting that it pales the Holocaust of Hitler. The sixth sign, an invasion of Israel from the north. You will come from your place in the far north, you and many nations with you. You will advance against my people Israel like a cloud that comes over the land. As the times were straining towards this last decade of the century, the seemingly unbreachable Berlin Wall simply crumbled. The mighty Soviet Union disintegrated. The world reeled from the shockwaves. Biblical prophecy shed some light on what this could mean in the new millennium. Despite the dictator's spurned godhood, Israel as a nation rests prosperous and secure in its covenant with the Federated States of Europe. But the thwarted Arab nations search hastily for allies. Students of biblical prophecy are inclined to believe that a nation of the north will do battle for them. The word of the Lord came to me. Son of man, set your face against Gog of the land of Magog the chief prince of Mesech and Tubal. Persia, Put, and Cush will be with them. Also Gomer with all his troops. The prophet Ezekiel foresees a new coalition, the nations of Persia and Ethiopia, Put and Gomer, under the leadership of Gog of Magog, to rival the Federated States of Europe. Biblical scholars have pored over the names in this prophecy. There is unanimous agreement on some and disagreement on others. Gog means end-time ruler, and Magog, a nation that is both powerful and terrifying. Some see Moscow in the word Mesek, others disagree.
Before the events of 1989, it was easy to judge the atheistic Soviet Union to be the Gog of Magog of the scriptures. With the breakup of the Soviet Union, judgments have been reassessed, and the old forces are stirring. Reunion is possible. Scholars are certain that the invasion will come from the north. For thousands of years, the land of Israel has always been invaded from the north. Though north is not necessarily the location of every invader's homeland, the identity of the member states of this coalition is quite clear. Persia, which is present-day Iran, is one. Ethiopia, once allied with the former Soviet Union, is another. Put is the biblical name for what today is Libya. Only the nation called Goma is controversial. For decades, Goma was believed to be communist East Germany. But now that East and West Germany have been united, there are doubts. Significantly, the names of these states go back to the first book of the Bible, to Japheth, the son of Noah. After the great flood, the sons of Japheth went north to the land of Rosh. Rosh sounds like Russia. As some biblical scholars prudently point out, the name Russia, derived from the Rus Vikings who founded the kingdom of Kiev, did not come into existence until the 9th century AD. It is not clear why the federated states of Europe do not repel the Gog of Magog and his coalition. What is clear is that while Israel sleeps in the security of its new covenant, Gog and his allies attack like a cloud covering the land. is successful. However, the invaders are overly confident. They presume ownership of Israel's resources before winning them. I will summon a sword against Gog on all my mountains. Now the Lord God himself shows his face on the side of his chosen. The fish of the sea the birds of the air, the beasts of the field, every creature that moves along the ground, and all the people on the face of the earth will tremble at my presence. The mountains will be overturned, the cliffs will crumble, and every wall will fall to the ground. Gog and his coalition are destroyed. So great is the devastation that it takes seven months to bury all of the dead and seven years to dispose of the horrid debris. But this war is a mere prelude to what is to come. Zechariah of the Old Testament prophesies that all the nations will descend upon the land of Israel to do battle at Armageddon. In 1942, December the 2nd, at this site at the University of Chicago, the atom was first split. In the split second of that first atomic flash, a new age came into being, the age of nuclear energy and of nuclear war. If the Battle of Armageddon is inevitable, it will be a holocaust of nuclear firepower. If this comes to pass, one could say the battle had its origins at this spot, where Henry Moore's commemorative sculpture now stands. The seventh sign, the Battle of Armageddon. I will gather all the nations to Jerusalem to fight against it.
Zechariah of the Old Testament prophesies that all the nations will descend upon the land of Israel to do battle. He foresees a battle in which a goodly part of the human race will perish. The name of the place where this battle will be fought strikes terror into the heart. Armageddon. Many Christians believe that the whole of Jewish history is a chronicle of Satan's efforts to destroy God's chosen people and to upset God's plan of redemption for mankind. The time is coming when this adversary of God makes a great final effort to achieve his ends. Megiddo is peaceful now. In the ancient world, this was a vital crossroads for trade. Below the ruins of the city you now see, lie buried 20 other Megiddos, one on top of the other. The city has been rebuilt 20 times. The valley of Megiddo stretches from the Mediterranean across northern Israel. When Napoleon visited, his military assessment was that in the Megiddo plain, nature had made her greatest battlefield. We know Megiddo better by its other name, Armageddon. Through the offices of the dictator of the Federated States of Europe and his false prophet, God's adversary draws the armies of the world to do battle in this broad valley. It will be the last battle human beings ever fight. They march from every point of the compass. More armies sweep down from the north. Other armies will invade from the south. Under the god of war, the only god that the Antichrist will acknowledge other than himself, the Federated States of Europe dispatch frack troops from the west, troops with superior weapons, but an army of vastly superior numbers pours in from the east, east of the Euphrates. Since this army is prophesied to be 200 million strong, one suspects a coalition of Asian nations headed by China. From north, south, east and west they come and they clash here. I saw heaven open, and there before me was a white horse, whose rider is called Faithful and True. On his robe and on his thigh he has this name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Christ, who has returned in glory, judges the godless nations. From his holy city, Jerusalem, he will reign triumphant, and his kingdom 
will become eternal. The unholy trinity is crushed. Satan is forever banished. The redeemed of humankind live in the bliss of God's unchallenged reign over the universe. To those outside the fold, the prophesied future may seem very gloomy. The believers try to see through the chaos to Christ's coming. They claim that the message of prophecy is not fearful, it is charged with hope. And they take comfort in the advice given by Jesus when he foresaw these events. When these things come to pass, look up and lift your head. Behold, I am coming soon. My reward is with me, and I will give to everyone according to what he has done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end.